Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank thee for all the ways of linking our lives to the lives of others. Through speech and song, through joyous adventure and common hardship, through mutual understanding and sympathy, through common aspirations and common purpose. We are hopelessly in debt to the generosity of those who have made this building possible and to the leader to whom it is dedicated. We pray to make us discontent with present attainments. Do make us alert to opportunities that come to us to witness our appreciation to men and women who have made this evening possible. O oh God, teach us to find our share in this gift through the sharing of it, to find the blessing from this gift through the giving of it. In the name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. Distinguished guests on the platform, choir, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it a compliment to have been selected as the master of ceremonies for such an auspicious occasion. This is another red letter day for Ball State Teachers College, for Muncie, and for Eastern Indiana. We are assembled formally to dedicate the John R. Emmons College Community Auditorium. The venture is a unique accomplishment in the annals of town and gown relationship. I personally know of no other instance where a comparable effort of this magnitude has been successfully concluded. Only an extraordinary rapport between town and gown could make possible such an eminently worthwhile undertaking, an edifice designed to serve well the cultural aspirations not only of our generation, but of generations yet to come. Surely, our age will stand out in history it is no idle figure of speech to say that we are living on a constantly shrinking globe in an ever-expanding universe. The tumultuous developments of the last six decades have made demands upon our educational institutions completely uncontemplated at the turn of the century. In an age such as ours, where the accent is so heavily slanted toward the scientific and the utilitarian, it is well for us to remember that there is a cultural facet of our being that must be nourished if the ultimate in good living is to be attained. In contemporary American life, the university campus is the logical place for such nourishment to take root. It was this concept, energetically implemented by both college and community, that brought into being the edifice which we are dedicating this evening. No greater attestation of the importance of this event is needed than the fact that our governor has seen fit to take time out of his busy schedule to be with us this evening. And I might add, with election day only 10 days off, he is extraordinarily busy at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Matthew E. Welch. Governor of the Sovereign State of Indiana. Governor Welch. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernard, President Emmons, and friends of Ball State Teachers College. It is a real pleasure for me to be here tonight, this season of the year, particularly to address a nonpartisan group for a change. And it is also a genuine pleasure to share in the dedication of this beautiful building. It is fitting that the auditorium should be named after President John Emmons. It is a part of the plan that he developed for the growth of this college 17 years ago, and it reflects his faith and his perseverance. Under his leadership, this college 
soon to become a university, has become nationally recognized for its excellence. The cultural advantages that will be gained in the use of this auditorium will enhance the well-deserved reputation it has. Happily, both the college and the Muncie community can point with justifiable pride to the John R. Emmons College Community Auditorium, for it is the natural result of the excellent working relationship between this great city and its people and the college and the college community. The cooperation, the hard work, the generosity and the faith in the future that has gone into the construction of this building will serve as a model for communities across the nation. Indiana, as a state, is proud of Muncie and what it has achieved. It is proud of Ball State Teachers College and proud of the man who gave this idea leadership. President John Emmons, who so richly deserves the honors that come to him this evening. Thank you very much, Governor. It's always good to have you in our midst, sir. Not only do we have the first citizen of our state with us this evening, we have the first citizen of our city, our mayor, Honorable John V. Hampton. Mr. Hampton, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Your request for equal time, John, has been referred to the Federal Communications Commission. <laughs> Those of you who are politically minded will take note that designedly we place the governor at this end and the mayor at the other. <laughs> <clears throat> During the first half of the century, Muncie was signally blessed with an extraordinarily fine type of civic leadership generated from within its own ranks. Had it not been for the foresight and generosity of the Ball brothers, this institution would not be a reality today. I am about to present to you a man, also generated from within our own ranks, without whose relentless efforts this building would not be a reality today. He is the man under whose leadership this community put together approximately half of the dollars to make this building possible. Plucky, punctilious, persuasive, persistent. An alumnus of Ball State, recently a recipient of the Alumni Distinguished Service Award, recently also a recipient of the College Community Headliner Award. Citizen Extraordinary, Mr. Ralph J. Whiting. In the words of the Nazarene, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We in our community are most fortunate in that we have had the satisfaction of making gifts which will not only benefit the present generation, but will benefit the students of Ball State and the citizens of our community for generations to come. This beautiful auditorium which we are dedicating tonight costs a total of $2,975,000. Of this amount, 1465000 was borrowed and will be paid by the students of the college during the next 20 years. The community contribution to this edifice amounted to a million five hundred and ten thousand. It is indeed gratifying to have been a part of this undertaking and to have not only reached our goal, but exceeded it by $10,000. I could talk with you about the many problems that we faced in raising these funds, 
the dedicated efforts of those who worked so diligently in the campaign. I could speak with you about the newspapers, the radio stations, television stations, without whose wholehearted cooperation, success would not have been possible. Without, I could tell you about the faculty and the students and the alumni of Ball State who gave so generously. I could thank many who might possibly have given more than their share, but I would prefer to have you join me in enjoying the dedication of this auditorium, to join with me in the feeling of pride of accomplishment of a job well done, to join with me in the satisfaction of knowing that this auditorium will stand for many decades as a tribute to the forward-looking citizens in our community who made it possible through their dollars and their efforts. I would like to pay special tribute to Bill Craig and Dick Jennings, who served as co-vice chairman during the campaign that raised these funds. Mr. Craig was unable to be with us this evening. However, I'd like to ask Dick Jennings to stand and receive recognition for the many hours of effort he spent. Dick, will you stand? I would be remiss if I did not also pay tribute to Frank Bernard, who served as chairman of the Policy and Planning Committee for his efforts, and who is our master of ceremony tonight. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, I would like to introduce several individuals who speak but a few of the many groups that supported our campaign so generously. I would appre appreciate your withholding any applause for these individuals since we are on the air. I would first like to introduce Marshall Hanley. Marshall Hanley, a Muncie attorney, a member of the Ball State Teachers College Foundation, speaks for all of the professional people in Muncie who participated in the auditorium campaign fund drive. Marshall. <clears throat> Mr. Whitinger, Governor Welsh, President Emmons, ladies and gentlemen. For President Emmons, the pursuit of excellence has been the continuous program of Ball State. It has been his determination to achieve, in his own words, the measure of difference between merely an adequate college and a truly excellent one. The auditorium we are here to dedicate is a striking example of material achievement of excellence. From its beginning, Ball State has been primarily concerned with the education of professional people, and it is the position of eminence in the educational world that our college now enjoys that marks its finest achievement in excellence. For the professional community of this area, the faculty of our college, as well as the others of us engaged in allied professional endeavors, this auditorium will be a very special hall. An important task of the college is to provide an environment in which students and the community may become more sensitive to truth and to beauty. The appreciation to be drawn from the world's great literature, from conversation and lectures, from experiencing various art forms, and from living among well-designed buildings are an important part of the whole pattern of education. This auditorium is a magnificent contribution to the cultural community, and its special achievement in the pursuit of excellence will be the aesthetic enrichment of the lives of all who come through its doors. We who have come through its doors this evening are already enriched by being a friend of John R. Emmons. Each of us, Mr. President, is very proud to have had even a small part in achieving this bit of excellence, which will forever bear your name. Next, we will hear from C. Cree Gable, a local businessman, has been active in all phases of the auditorium building program. He served as co-chairman of the Mercantile Division in the Fund Drive. He served as chairman of the College Communi Community Auditorium Advisory Committee, which has established policies and procedures for the use of the auditorium by the community groups. He is a member of the Ball State Teachers College Foundation. Mr. Gable represents the many monthly business firms that participated in the drive. Free Gable. 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we strive to have our lives happy and successful. And one factor that plays a very important part is proper balance. Likewise, a community, to be at its best, should have proper balance. Our community has educational, athletic, and recreational facilities, but was lacking something until this, the John R. Ammons College Community Auditorium, became a reality. In traveling, I've seen countries with culture, theaters, auditoriums, and so forth, but no freedom. I've seen people with all the freedom in the world and no culture, no theater, no auditorium. In our balanced community, we have practically everything and freedom to do, hear, and see what we want. Financial institutions, retail business, wholesale business, news media, service industries, in fact, all Muncie businesses of every kind have been glad to help make this community greater by sharing in making the John R. Emmons College Community Auditorium possible. Van P. Smith, President of Ontario Corporation, speaks for Muncie Industry, large and small. He served as co-chairman of the Employees Division for the Fund Drive. Van Smith. Our distinguished community colleague and good friend, so properly honored tonight, Dr. Jack Emmons and his family gathered here for this dedication. To our chairman, Governor Welch, Reverend Clergy. Those of us engaged in manufacturing, often called industry, have enthusiastically contributed a portion of voluntary time and financial support to this most impressive example of community activity. Or may I say, in a more broad use of the word, this most impressive example of community industry. For industry in its more general meaning identifies diligence. It identifies that assiduous activity directed toward the completion of any work or task. Certainly this tangible auditorium, and more importantly, the intangible accompanying cultural opportunity for our community, stands as a monumental tribute to the industrious nature of our Muncie community and to this fine institution of learning. As local manufacturers, we are proud to have played our part in this endeavor, and we salute the industrious Muncie community for completing this unique and wholesome community college venture. We realize the true significance of this endeavor when we reflect on the observation of Somerset Maughan, and I quote, culture is not just an ornament. It is the expression of a nation's character, and at the same time, a powerful instrument to mold character. The end of culture is right living. Charles R. Anderson, one of an active group of later labors, labor leaders who supported the fund drive from its inception, speaks for labor today as president of the Delaware County Council, AFL-CIO, Charles Anderson. Thank you, Ralph. <clears throat> Mr. Bernard, the Honorable Governor Welsh, Mr. Ammons and family. I'm glad to see so many of you here tonight for this dedication of the John R. Ammons College Community Auditorium. I am sure it might have been an effort on some of your parts to leave your television sets tonight to come here this evening. You know, last week I saw an interruption through political announcements and said for the next 30 minutes, we're going to show you a movie this evening. The plot of the story was three persons and a piece of paper. It showed what a banker called an unsecured paper, a politician called the same paper an election pledge, and a diplomat called a treaty. 
It was through the combined effort of many segments of the community that made possible this beautiful college community auditorium. The members of organized labor were the first group approached on this community project. And we gave an all out effort, effort as the largest segment of the community to enrich the people's lives of this community with such a building. The nation is faced with enormous challenges and the only way we can respond, is broad, and broadly speaking, is through education. We must demand vital reforms, better educational services, broadened services, whereby all citizens, without regard to age, race, or religion, may have opportunities. And this is an opportunity to which we all may come and enjoy. Above all, we must be willing to spend money as well as we have on this beautiful architectural structure whereby everyone may share in the intellectual and so, uh, social development of all of our citizens. Free time may be treated as a kind of raw material, as a basis of resource which can be converted into true leisure so that it becomes the means whereby individuals find warm rewards and the society finds new enrichment and diversity. We have been able through the auditorium to bring the arts into the center of our lives. Before we had to drive to such places as Indianapolis or other distant points in order to be able to see the performing arts. Now we can bring them into our own community, musicians, actors, dancers, singers, poets, who are second to none. In a cultural center such as this, at the end of a working day, you can leave the fumes and the noises behind and relax in a beautiful atmosphere such as we are this evening. We will see this building not merely as concrete, steel, stage, and seats. It will not be just another hall on a campus. Rather, it will be a place where ideas are received, where they are created, natured, and then you go on and see the beautiful things that we saw here this evening with this choir. It will be a nerve center for all culture, organizations of the community. Labor is glad to be a part of another community project that will benefit so many in this growing community of ours. Jack Peckinpah <clears throat> was president of the Ball State Alumni Association when the auditorium campaign drive was underway. A graduate of Ball State, he is a Muncie insurance man and president of the school board for the Muncie Community Schools. Jack Peckinpah to speak for the alumni. Dr. Emmons, Governor Welch, and friends of Ball State. On behalf of the 26,000 Ball State alumni, I wish to express our appreciation to the citizens of Muncie for joining with us, the alumni, in this unique fundraising venture. A unique venture because a civic community has joined an academic community to make a great cultural center a reality. With the use of this new dimensional, superb structure, future Ball State students certainly will be better citizens as a result of the varied experiences and culture opportunities afforded them. These experiences will have an ever-widening effect on the future generations of young people that come in contact with the Ball State graduate either in the classroom, the office, or other working area in which he, the graduate, serves. This building will bring to Muncie an enrichment program that will be second to none. Both students and citizens will have many opportunities to witness performances of the great, both in the entertainment and educational fields. The Emmons Auditorium will be a lasting memorial to this distinguished and honorable man whom we proudly call our president.
Jean, <clears throat> Jean Britton, a pretty young miss from Indianapolis, is here this evening representing the Ball State student body, who incidentally have more than a passing interest in this great hall. She is a member of the Auditorium Dedication Committee. Jeannie Britton. As representative of the Ball State student body, I would like to thank you, Dr. Emmons, the State Teachers College Board, and you, the Muncie community leaders, for helping to make it possible to build this new auditorium. We students appreciate the facilities here in this auditorium as compared to the limited scale we once knew in Assembly Hall. For now, many of us have the opportunities to hear lectures by prominent national figures. We also now get to see and hear full-scale productions of musicals, symphonies, operas, and of course entertainment, such as Fred Waring and our latest homecoming attraction, Mr. Louis Armstrong. The Ball State students are partners with the community in the fundraising endeavor. Yet, your fund drive is over and your pledges have been paid, but ours will go on for 20 years. As you know, one half of the $3 million that it cost to build this auditorium was raised through the sale of public bonds, and it is this portion of the debt that we will continue to pay. However, we students are paying this willingly and gladly, not only because we will reap great benefits from it, but also because many future college students, some of whom may even be our own children, will succeed us as beneficiaries. Again, may I say that we, the students here at Ball State, are sincerely proud of this new auditorium, and we are most grateful to each one of you for your large share in helping to make it possible. I am sure you would like to join me in applauding these individuals. It was through their efforts and the folks that they represent that made this auditorium possible for our community and our college. It is now my pleasure to present to you what is referred to in your program as the auditorium building team. In the interest of conserving air time, I will call your attention to the dedication booklet, which is in your hand. This records the splendid manner in which each member of the, this team functions in his particular specialty. First, Mr. Walter Scholler, Jr., the architectural firm of Walter Scholler and Associates of Lafayette, Indiana. This firm has been responsible for many of the fine buildings on this campus, as well as Purdue and other Indiana colleges, Mr. Scholler. Now, this isn't in the script, but I'm just an adventurer at heart, and here goes. Uh, I got some news for you, Junior. There was another man who was bringing architectural beauty to this campus when you were still in knee pants. His father, Walter Shoulder, is sitting out here in the audience. Get up and take a bow, Mr. Shoulder. Mr. Heinrich Holtz of Hamburg, Germany, recognized as one of the leading acoustical engineers of the world, cannot be with us this evening. He has had many difficult assignments, both abroad and in our country. He was the third man, for one example, to be called in to correct the acoustical difficulties in Philharmonic Hall and Lincoln Center, New York, and the first, by the way, to succeed. He has done a superb job for us here, when he cannot be with us, we recognize him and pay our respects to him in absentia. The third member of the team is the third member of the team is another man from Lafayette. He was responsible for all the stage equipment and lighting system, 
also assisted the firm installing microphones, recording equipment, and auxiliary units. He is the director of the Hall of Music at Purdue University, as well as the Loeb Playhouse. We are much in his debt, Mr. John W. Didmore. The skill of a, re of a reputable contractor is always essential to the final consummation of building dreams and plans. Ball State has found the Hegerman Construction Company of Fort Wayne to be just such a firm on this building as well as other campus structures. May I present the firm representative for this occasion, Mr. Ted Hegerman. Someone has very aptly said, the future belongs to those who prepare for it. The phrases which would best describe the next man I am to present could be quiet in manner, unostentatious in conduct, self-effacing in demeanor, so much so in fact that I sometimes wonder whether his real value is fully recognized by his community and by his state. When the occasion demands, however, he can be 10 feet tall. He certainly has had a very vital part in preparing for Ball State's future during the 10 years he has been a member of the board of its trustees. I present to you now Mr. Alec M. Bracken, president of the board of trustees of Ball State Teachers College. Mr. Bracken's function this evening is as set forth in the program you have in your hand. Mr. Bracken. Thank you, Mr. Bernard, <clears throat> Governor Welch, platform guests, and ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to present to you the two other members of State Teachers College Board who are seated tonight on the platform. First, may I introduce Mr. Kenneth Osborne, Vice President of the Board from La Porte, Indiana. Mr. Osborne. <laughs> and Ms. Thelma Ballard from Marion, Indiana. Ms. Ballard. <laughs> there are two other members of the State Teachers College Board who unfortunately were not able to be here tonight. Mr. Floyd Hine, who was secretary of the board from uh, Connorsville, and Mr. William Wilson, the state superintendent of public instruction who serves ex, ex officio as a member of our board. I also would like to mentioned to you that at the meeting of the college board, which was held October 7th, the board took official action in recognizing by an appropriate resolution the tremendous contribution which this community has made and also Ball State students and alumni everywhere in providing this million and a half dollars without which this auditorium could not be here tonight. Also in the resolution, we express deep gratitude on behalf of the board for everyone who has contributed so generously and who worked so hard in getting the funds uh, available. This resolution, as I say, has been made a matter of record of the board. As president of the State Teachers College Board, I welcome this opportunity to pay tribute to John R. Emmons, the president of Ball State Teachers College. Since the founding of Ball State by generous and public-spirited citizens almost 50 years ago now, this college has grown from a small institution to the one that we know today. Certainly measured by any yardstick, whether it be physical plant, scope of the curriculum, caliber of the faculty, or the number of students enrolled. It is a facility for higher education of which we can all be justly proud. But for a college, as well as any other undertaking, it is, it is the people who determine the destiny. And Ball State Teachers College would not exist today as we know it had it not from the beginning attracted dedicated men and women whose lives were devoted to service of others. 
Fortunately for this college and this community, one of those men so attracted was John R. Emmons, who, with his charming wife, Aline, and their two sons, Dick and David, came to Muncie and to this college August the 1st, 1945. Dr. Emmons as its president and the sixth man to head this institution. 1945 was near the end of the Second World War. It was a strategic moment. Just as Ball State was beginning to burst the bounds which had kept it a comparatively small college with relatively slender resources and moderate influence. The Emmons family roots are in the soil of Michigan. Jack Emmons was born and reared in the town of Prattville. He spent his undergraduate years in Eastern Michigan University and pursued his graduate studies at the University of Michigan receiving in 1936 his Doctorate of Philosophy. Might also add that Dr. Emmons has been recognized through the conferral of honorary degrees by Eastern Michigan University, Wayne State University, Hanover College, <coughs> Washburn University, and just spring of 1964, Loyola University. President Emmons' professional background includes 44 years in education, starting as a teacher in a one-room rural school. From there, he became a mathematics teacher and principal. Following that, he was deputy superintendent of public instruction in the superintendent's office of the state of Michigan, following which he became a college teacher, being first at Jackson Junior College, then at Eastern Michigan University, and at Wayne State University. During this period, he taught during the summers at the University of Michigan, at Purdue, at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Texas. And immediately before moving to Muncie, he was director of personnel of the Detroit Public Schools. He has a well-earned reputation as one of the foremost educators of the nation. His knowledge and appreciation of teacher education <coughs> has acquired for him the high recognition from his fellow educators, as shown by his election either as president or as a member of the executive committee of every major educational association in the United States. To name a few, he has been president of the North Central Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools, the Association for Higher Education, the Indiana Conference on Higher Education, and the Association of State Colleges and Universities. He has also uh, served as a member of the President's Commission on Higher Education, and in 1953, was a lecturer for the United States Department of State in India, and in 1955 served on the Armed Services Education Program Committee, which took him to military installations in most of the countries of Western Europe. One would think that these educational and professional assignments alone would keep him fully occupied. But in addition, President Emmons has found time as a busy college president for many civic and community activities, serving on the board of the Merchants National Bank of Muncie, the Ball Memorial Hospital Association, and this year has just, is just completing the United Fund Drive in Muncie as its chairman. This names only a few of his civic and community activities. He maintains an active affiliation with the First United Presbyterian Church in Muncie and is also a member of the Rotary Club. For John Emmons, <clears throat> I have the highest admiration and affection, and I shall always be proud that I was granted the privilege of serving 
as a member of the college board during his presidency. For through this association, it has afforded me the opportunity for closer contact with him, sharing to an extent, at least, some of his problems, his objectives, and his devotion, not only to this college, but to this community. With vision born of experience and imagination, he saw Ball State Teachers College discharging an ever larger responsibility in, re in response to the growing need of higher education in Indiana. He has directed the refocusing of its program in the broader terms which will, I am certain, result in the acknowledgement of its university status. Under his effective leadership, besides a substantial growth, which is apparent to all of us, particularly those of us who live in this area, uh, growth in size and resources academic strength has been materially increased. Today, and since President Emmons has been here and president of the college, more than 50% of the people whom he has hired to teach in Ball State have their doctoral degrees. This evening we honor you, President Emmons. We have seen in you a man with vision, an educator with faith, and a man of capacity who is very ably filling the important task as president of Ball State Teachers College. This auditorium is here today because of your planning, which began in 1947. I am greatly pleased and honored to unveil this bronze plaque of President Emmett. I'd like to tell you a word about the plaque. It was commissioned by the class of 1964 and is the work of Dr. Warren W. Casey, a former associate professor of art at Ball State, now the dean of the College of Fine Arts and the director of the art department of, women's, of Texas Women's University located in Denton, Texas. Dr. Casey joined <coughs> the Ball State faculty in 1948 and resigned this last August to accept the deanship of the Texas College. His sculptured work can be found elsewhere on this campus and at other places throughout the state. This plaque will be mounted in the north wall of the main foyer of this auditorium. And as I say, it gives me great pleasure to unveil this plaque, which will be mounted in John R. Emmons College Community Auditorium. No response is listed in the program, but naturally I wish to make a response. Mr. Bracken, Governor Welch, Mr. Bernard, Mr. Whitinger, representatives of platform guests, ball staters and community members, family and friends. Uh, just now I am almost uh, overwhelmingly aware of the honor which has been bestowed upon me, and I thank you. Mrs. Emmons and I thank you. Our sons and our families thank you. And as I express appreciation for the family, I think I should state that uh, the family includes our grandson, Jack, who is three, who says, uh, it's my popper's college. <laughs> and my Aunt Matey, the oldest living member of the Emmons clan. She's 92, but she writes in a strong hand to say, and I quote, I'm so proud to have my family name, Emmons, placed on the new auditorium where, pe where people will see it for years to come. End of the quote. So I thank you, and four generations of the Emmons family thank you. But let me hasten on to say that I'm also very much aware of the fact that any college building, and 
this building particularly, is not a one-man venture. I repeat, it's not a one-man venture. So far as we're able to determine, this is the first college and community auditorium built on a state college campus through the cooperative fundraising efforts of the citizens of the community, the alumni, the faculty and staff, and the students of any college or university in the world. This building provides the best example that we know of cooperative effort and support. Community members, as you've already heard this evening, community members, corporations, business industry, and labor faculty, and the alumni raised a million and a half. The bond issue for the balance of the building will be paid off by the students who attend during the next 20 years. Literally thousands of us have been involved in this venture. The State Teachers College Board, the Ball State Teachers College Foundation, and all of us who assisted in the planning, in providing the dollars, in constructing and dedicating this building, we are now mutually back patting and handshaking as we congratulate ourselves and each other for this cooperative achievement. We are proud of the accomplishment of our building of this new college and community auditorium. But again, I'm aware that we don't raise money and build buildings merely for the sake of building buildings. We build them for people, for programs, and for services. The dream for and the process of buildings are interesting and challenging, but what happens next is really important. Perhaps an example. As I think of this building, or of any building, I keep saying to myself that it's very much like climbing Sugarloaf, the small mountain or a, or a large sand dune at which we look from our front window at the cabin. And climbing Sugarloaf is a project, whether one does it alone or whether one does it in a group. It's a pleasure to start the climb, to note the condition of the path, the plants and the trees, and sometimes we get snagged by the blackberry bushes, but we finally reach our objective the top of Sugarloaf, and then we get a view, a vista, six or seven lakes, Good Harbor Bay and Lake Michigan, and the Manitou Islands, and on a very clear day, Fox Island. All opportunities for new adventures. Now this building was a dream. It's now a reality. But I'm really interested, just as you are, in the vista, the view of the future, the opportunities, the challenges, and the responsibilities to dream more dreams. For instance, during the past three weeks, for these eight ceremonies that we've had for dedication purposes, the attendance in this one auditorium has been over 20,000 people. So this new dimension, our new college and community auditorium, is our dedicated investment in people and in the future. Again, I thank you. highly merited recognition for an exceedingly worthy recipient. Yeah. The Ball State Concert, Concert Choir and Men's Glee Club, directed by Donald L. Nguyen, assisted by Trombone Choir, Bernard Pressler, Director, Trumpet Choir, Donald Kuchback, Director, will now favor us with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It would be taking nothing away from the other capably run departments of Ball State to say that its music department has been one of its outstanding achievements. And I am sure after this number you would consider me remiss if I did not express our appreciation of Miss Elizabeth Malloy for her performance at the organ and to Dr. Noyan and his choral group for their number. We're now approaching the end of the formal dedicatory portion of this program. But one more thing should be done. Uh, programs just don't happen, certainly one as faultlessly planned as this. 
And again, I think you would be remiss if I didn't call on Miss Marie Fraser as chairman of the dedication committee to stand up and take a bow. Ms. Fraser? Now, several minutes will be required to clear the stage and rearrange the stage for that which is to follow. And it'll be a sort of a seventh inning stretch. Um, you will please be back in your seats not later than 10 minutes from now, which on the nose is about 8 o'clock, at 8.10 or sooner. Please be back in your seats. You have a treat yet to come.